privilege to come and share here at Worship Center and to be a part of this family. I, I am a father. I'm a grandfather. And I told the folks in the first service that uh, if Corey were being really honest, he would probably call me a grandfather. Because when he calls me at home, usually 7 or 8 o'clock at night, he always asks if I'm in bed yet. (laughs) I want to share a little history with you today and by way of introduction to, to the message. 66 years ago, I was born Arthur Leroy, the firstborn of Ralph and Louise Fleming. I had hoped they would be here this morning. Uh, They're uh, residents up at Good Sam in Silverton, but uh, my mom was not feeling well, so they were not able to make it. Sixty years ago, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ into my life. I was six years old. But... In the years after that, I lived a selfish, self-serving life. And it wasn't the church's fault. I was raised in a good church. I had godly parents. The pastors that were a part of the church were caring. But I chose to indulge my sinful self. And I couldn't wait to get out and enjoy the pleasures of the world. Thankfully, when I turned 18, just a short while after that, God reached into my life and invited me to take a different direction. And by his grace, I said yes. And I became a new person. I took a different direction, a different path. God gave me new life. He filled me with his spirit, and he even anointed me for ministry. A couple of years later, I met Doris Matson. I was at Bible College, and uh, the, the name of our college was Mountain View Bible College. But a lot of people called it Mountain View Bridal College. Because <laughs> a lot of kids who went there got married. Um, we celebrate 46 years of wedded bliss today. So. been a wonderful ride. Been a little bumpy at times, but it's been great, and God's grace has brought us through. I'm the father of Angela Dawn, John Bradley, Stephen Chad, and Timothy Ryan, the grandfather of Jackie, William, Zachary, Deanna, Jacinda, Daniel, Emily, Noah, and Natalie. These are the people that God has surrounded me with and my own family, the closest people to me in the world. But I I want to share with you the names of some other people, people that God has brought into my life that have spoken into my life over the years. Most of them you won't know, but I want you to listen to their names. Dave Passe. Howard Hornby, Ken Fromm, Linda Snyder. Linda and her husband Daryl lived in the apartment right next to us in college. It was an old armory barracks. The walls were so thin we could knock on each other's wall and invite each other over for games or dinner or whatever through the wall. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, Daryl, Linda's husband, Uh, called on the phone and said they were coming through Wallace and wondered if we could have dinner together. We had not seen them in 45 years. We had a great time together. Uh, Linda was one of those classmates who always challenged the rest of us to think. Uh, She was a little controversial at times, but she made us think. And she made us study hard. Sid Volman, Marie Corliss, 
Larry Nielsen, Bill Vermillion, Dan Palmer, Benny Harrison, Maybell Butts, Joe Kimball, Sonny Wafer. Sonny was my spiritual father. Uh, I pastored a church in a little town called Ten Mile down near Roseburg, Oregon. He pastored in, a, in another small town called Camas Valley. And for several years, he just mentored me and encouraged me and held my hand to the fire. Um, and I thank him for all that he meant in my life. Roland Smith, Roland Miller, excuse me, Marilyn Carver, Richard Jansen, Don Berger, Terry and Janice DeVoe, Mike and Laura Borden, Corey Birdie. You have a great pastor. You have a great pastor. And he calls me a father, and uh, he's fast becoming that. And God has given him a unique place. Uh, it's pretty cool that Woody Woodward would call Corey Birdie to get some things done. And that isn't the first time that's happened. Others in the community look to Corey. And that is only going to increase because I believe that God has put that mantle upon him, that he really has an apostolic mantle in this community. David Zumstein, Chuck Cushman, Don McPeak, some of you know Don, he was the manager at KWAL, he passed away just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, younger than me, Don and I were born the same year in the same month, I'm 20 days older than he is, uh, we both got married the same year, and we both got married to Adoras, <laughs> and uh, Don Don um, was my biggest cheerleader when I was doing the program on KWAL called Finding God. And his son came up to me last week when I met with the family. I'm going to be doing his memorial service this coming Saturday. And his son came up to me and said, you saved my dad's life. But I look forward to seeing Don McPeak in heaven one day. Vince and Sidney Lee, Mort Saro, Mo Pellisur, Leela Whips, Amy's grandmother. We did her memorial service last Sunday. Leela was up at Good Sam for several years. Wonderful, wonderful lady of God. And Amy and her sisters have shared with me her journals, how she prayed for her family. And she would share with me how she would pray for her family and how she'd try to write letters to them. Got to be hard for her as she grew older. But what a, what a, what a woman of God. Jim Hendrickson. Gordon Mills. Carrie Schramm. You know, these are just a few names in my personal Hall of Fame. There's many, many others. And I'm humbled that God would use these people, these amazing people, to speak into my life, to bless me. And what's really cool is that just like this, na this list, which you, you may think is kind of long from listening to it, but it's much longer than that, really. But, but this list represents a list just like that for every one of them and every one of you. There are people with names who have spoken into your life, who God has used to encourage you and build you up and turn your head towards him so that you would know him. I was at a conference a few years ago with a pastor named Joseph Garlington. And Joseph, as he got up and he 
picked up his Bible. He says, open your Bibles anywhere. It's all good. I, I can be a brat sometimes in my mind. Immediately went to First Chronicles chapters 1 through 11. It's one name after another. And if you can pronounce even a quarter of them, you're pretty fortunate. Here, here's just an example. This is, this is just four verses out of 11 chapters. The son of Helah, of Zareth, Izhar, and Ethnan. Koz fathered Anub. I, I don't know if I'm saying these right at all. I say Elkanah. He says, El what did you say? Elkanah. So. <laughs> Zobida. The, the clans of Aharahel. That sounds scary. The son of Haram. And then, then there's one we recognize, right? Because of Bruce Wilkinson. Jabez was the more honorable of his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez saying, Because I bore him in pain. Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, that you might, your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. And then it goes right back into the list. <laughs> Chilub, the brother of Shub, Shuha, who fathered Meher, who fathered Ishtan. You'd say them all different, I'm sure. There are 3,200 names given to people throughout the scripture, plus. People that God makes a point of mentioning by name. And frankly, if, if you're honest, or maybe, maybe you're not, maybe you're not like me, when I come to First Chronicles, when I'm reading through the Bible, I just, and I'm at verse 12. Twelve, just like that. I mean, I can get through a lot of chapters because I really don't try very hard. A few years ago, God had me just in my personal devotions in the book of Nehemiah. And in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3 is kind of like that. There's a whole list of names that are difficult to pronounce. So I was reading through the book of Nehemiah numerous times, sometimes four or five times a month, and, and God had me in there for a year, just going through it, just speaking into my life. And one day he says, why do you keep skipping chapter 3? Why do you keep skipping chapter 3? And so I started to read chapter 3, and I read it over and over again, just like, okay. And God began to reveal to me that these people that are mentioned are important. That they matter. That they were part of God's activity on the earth. That he knew them. That he appreciated them. And just as they were so important that God recorded their names for us to read, so are you. So are you. Angel, you're important to God. Angel just introduced himself to me before the service. I don't know quite a few of you by name, but some of you I do. Joe Warren, you're important to God. Bob Jutla, you're important. God knows you by name. Jennifer McDonald, God knows you by name. You know, one of the really cool things that I love about this church and about Pastor Corey is, is how empowering the atmosphere is here. How it, people come and, and God just seems to build them up and help them be more than they were before they came. And God's doing that in your life. These people are part of God's Hall of Fame. Now, very few of them were superstars. 
You know, we, we read about Moses and Abraham and David and Daniel and all these people. They're the superstars. And sometimes we think they're really the only ones in the Hall of Fame. And actually, we, we kind of take, what is it, Hebrews chapter 11, and there's this list of people, and, and we, we call that the Hall of Faith. But, but most of the time, we kind of think in our mind, they're the ones that really mattered. But God said all these other 3,000 mattered too, enough for him to put his name in a book that we call the Word of God. They're part of his hall of fame. And you and I are part of his hall of fame as well. Romans 15.4 tells us that the Old Testament scriptures were given to encourage us to have hope and endure us. So these long lists of names that are there at least in part remind us that we matter, that we have a role in God's economy. On this Father's Day, God wants to remind us that he knows our name. And to our Heavenly Father, we are significant. That we have value. That our lives are important enough for him to be paying attention. I want you to think for just a moment. The God, the God of the universe, the God who created the universe with stars so numerous that, that we can't number them, we can't even see them all with the most powerful microscopes. With the most powerful microscope, we can't even see the end of what God created. The God who created, the God who set everything in place, who the Scripture says holds it all together, the God who authored and implemented the, man, the plan of salvation for every person. Eight billion people on the face of the earth today and God designed and implemented a plan of salvation that is appropriate and significant and applicable to every last one of them, of us. He uniquely crafted every person who's ever lived. He, he listens to every prayer. So just, just think about this room this morning. If we think about the things that are on our heart, there's numerous ones of them. And if we all were to speak them at the same time, it would be kind of a, of, of sound like speaking in tongues, right? It would just be, whoosh. and God can separate them all out and hear every one of them with Attentiveness. He can hear every prayer. He's the head of the church that, by some estimates, is over a billion strong on the face of the earth today. And if any of us have our eyes open, that church is filled with issues. And he's the head of that, and he, he knows how to work with it. He loves it. He loves the whole world. And he's overcome the devil. And, and some of us have had some encounters with the devil. We know that we're not up to that task. But he is. He's overcome the enemy. And that God who, who, who can do all of that stuff, who has all of that stuff to, to take his attention, knows your name. He knows my name. And it's not just because it's in a book somewhere. It is, if we've accepted Christ. But he knows our name. Now, the scripture does not say that specifically. I want to give you, though, some scriptural reasons that we believe that, and that, that it makes sense. In Psalm 139, verses, verse 1, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and have known me. You know me. If you know me, you know my name. Let me read a little bit more from that passage of scripture. This is taken from the message translation. 
I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave. You know when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. You look behind me, and I look behind me, and you're there. Then ahead, and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. Wow. He knows us. He knows us. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9, the first part of that verse says, but now that you have come to know God, and then, then Paul pauses. He goes, no, rather you are known by God. You're known by God. God knows you. God speaks to his people Israel. In Isaiah chapter 43, and, and in this passage of Scripture, he describes his, his commitment to them. He says, For now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. He's speaking their name. He's speaking to his people. And in this case, it's Jacob and Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I have called you by name. You are mine. We're his people. He knows us. He knows us by name. Did I put all the other verses up there or just that one? Okay, we'll go to that one. Now, in the New Testament, there is a reference in Philippians 4.3 that, that there's a book that our names are written. And if, if we've put our faith and our trust in Jesus... If, if we have received Christ into our life, if we've accepted that plan of salvation that he designed for us, if we've, if we've put our faith in Christ, it, our names are written in what's called the book of life. Now, I don't know about you, I, I, don't, think, I don't think that there's this literal book in heaven because Jesus says, I am the life. I am the life. What, what I really think the book of life represents is the heart of God. Your name is written in the book of life, which is in the heart of God. It's in the heart of God. Your name is written there. When, when you put your faith in him, your name is written in the book of life. Now, in Revelation chapter 13 and then again in chapter 17 there's a there's a further reference to the book of life and in both of these passages the the the, the phrase do those come up if revelation 13 8 look at the second line everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain and then go to chapter 17 and is there a little bit more to that? Okay. Again, it says, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, I, I'm not here to try and scare you into making sure your name's written there. I, I, it is important. Okay? But, but the point that I want you to know is that even if your name is not in the book of the life, he knows your name. And maybe you're here today and you aren't confident you don't know for sure whether your name's in that book. You can. You simply have to receive. I mean, I don't know for sure how it works with the heart of God, but boy, it's just as simple as him transferring it from one side to the other. I mean, you just have to receive it. You just have to accept his offer of love and redemption for your life. And if you're hostile to that today, if you're ambivalent about it, if God still loves you, he still knows your name. He loves you. There's a couple of examples in the scripture of people who God actually tells that 
he knows their name. In Exodus chapter 33, and in verse 12, Moses is kind of questioning God, and, and he, he says, you know, the only thing you've told me is that you know my name. But then in verse 17, let's jump up to verse 17, it says, The Lord says to Moses, this is the very thing that you have spoken that I will de- do. For you have found favor in my sight. I know you by name. I know you by name. Now, Moses was one of the superstars, right? And I go, okay, God knows them. There was another guy that he says this to who was the king of the country that actually was holding the Israelites captive. He was a heathen king, if you want to use those kinds of phrases. And in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 45, it makes reference to this king. His name was Cyrus. And let's, let's just listen to what he says to Cyrus. I will give you, Cyrus, the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name, he says, I will go before you. I will level the exalted places. I will break the pieces of the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. He knows us. He knows us. You know, sometimes we kind of hide our names, you know. I I know people who really are hesitant to give you their name. It's kind of like if they give their name up, they're giving up their privacy or something. You can't do that with God. But I don't know why you would want to. I hope it's encouraging to you that God knows your name because he knows your name, he loves you. He cares for you. He wants to equip you. He wants to provide for you. And and in this whole discussion in the scripture of God knowing our name, he introduces an amazing thing that not only does he know the name that we have, the scripture tells us he wants to give us a new name. A new name. This isn't a diss on our earthly name. Our our earthly name is, is... is important. But the new name that God gives us takes our lives in it and it speaks into them the wholeness that God wants to have. The the completeness, the, the plan that He has for us that's fruitful, that understands everything we were designed to be. Sometimes God initiates that by speaking into our lives something about our own name. William was here earlier, and he was telling me how he, he, didn't, he didn't like his name William, so he'd go by Bill or Billy. And then God spoke to him one day, or someone spoke to them, and said, why don't you like your name? Don't you know it means guardian? And you go, wow. All of a sudden, William goes, oh, wow. Maybe William's all right. Maybe William's all right. Now he says, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be the guardian of. But God is, God is revealing that to William. And if you watch William, you see that happening. William's my neighbor. He just lives down the street from me. And I, and, I, and I can see it even from a distance, what God's doing in William's life. It's a cool thing. My middle name is Leroy. For 50 years of my life, I wouldn't have told you that. Because to me, Leroy was a dumb, poorly dressed, toothless hillbilly. (laughs) And I didn't want to be that. And then one day, God revealed to me what Leroy really means. And, And he didn't, it wasn't like this bolt of lightning. It was in the dictionary. Leroy means king. It's a French word that means king. 
Now you go, oh, that probably puffed you up a little bit. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it did, really. But, but here's, here's something that we all need to understand. The scripture says that he has made us kings and priests to our God. You see, God's view of you and I is so much greater than our view of ourselves. And when he knows us by name, he wants to give us a new name to bring who we are to the fullness of who he created us to be. I'm probably getting way ahead of the scriptures. Sorry about that. Isaiah 62 I have a list here that tells me what I actually gave them to put up here. So, okay. 62.2 says, You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. But it goes on. It says, You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken. Your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her. Your land will be called married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. And as for the young men, as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your, young, your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Revelation chapter 3, or chapter 2, and then again in chapter 3, talks about the new name that God wants to write on a stone that no one can know except the one who receives it. And then in chapter 3, I love what it says here because it connects it for us. It says, Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, my own, God speaking, my own new name. When, when God speaks a new name into our life, it's not like he turns my name from Art to John. He, he, when he speaks of the new name in my life, he speaks a name that reflects who he designed me to be in his own image. You see, we, we get the name of God written on us. We get the name of God written on us. In Isaiah chapter 62, there's an example of the new name that God writes. And he says, They shall be called the holy people the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. All of those names reflect who God is. He's holy. He's a redeemer. He's one who seeks us out. He's one who does not forsake. And so those names that he's giving to Israel reflect who he is. And they're and he wants to impart them to you and I so that we too would understand how we are to reflect who our Father is. I'm a Fleming because my dad was a Fleming. People tell me that I look more like my dad the older I get. My kids are starting to even look like me a little bit. Because they're Flemings. We're to look like our Heavenly Father. And the name that He gives us, the new name that He gives us, is to speak into our lives that reality. Doris and I were at a leadership development retreat a few years ago, and the speaker was speaking about God's new name for us. And as he, as he brought, came to the application part of his speech, he, he asked us to just go out from, from the room and, and take a little time and ask God to speak, to, to listen for his voice and, and see if God would speak a new name into our lives. Now, probably not to my credit, but I don't remember what I heard. My wife remembers what she heard. 
And she heard something from the Lord for herself, but she also heard something from the Lord for me. And, and that's the way it works a lot of times, folks. Sometimes you, you, you don't get to hear. And I don't know why. There are probably lots of reasons. But the name that God spoke to her for me was the restorer of broken walls. And that has been God's design in my life. That, that's why what Corey said about the ministerial has been true. God speaks things like that into it because God is the restorer of broken walls. That's who he is. And it's not to my credit that that's why he called it. It's, it's reflecting what he is doing. And who he is. The new name that he wants to give you today is an expression of his heart as a father. His, an expression of his commitment to you. His understanding of how he designed you. Of what's going to make our lives full and complete and fruitful. The name of God will reflect his character, his redemptive activity, his eternal plan in our lives. You know, the cool thing about the new name is it'll never be forgotten. And it'll never be on a gravestone. It's a testimony in the heavenlies of our place with Christ at the right hand of God. Now, I want to assure you of something. I want to guarantee you something. The new name that God speaks into your life will never be hopeless. It will never be forgotten. It will never be unforgiven. It will never be no mercy. It will never be defeated. It'll never be enslaved or insignificant. God's name for you will be life-giving, hope-inspiring. It'll be that you're gifted, blessed, fruitful, redeemed, useful, and valuable. We're going to take a few minutes this morning and ask God to speak to us. Guys are going to come up here and we're going to do that song that was in the worship set that says that he knows our name. But I, I want you to ask your Heavenly Father to speak his new name to you. We're not looking for a name here that you can go around to everybody. God told me my new name. You want to hear it? It's not about that. It's not about that. It's a name that he wants to minister into your heart and life, his purpose for you, his, his value of you, of, of your day, of your relationships, of what he's doing in your life. I don't want you to feel bad if you don't hear something today because like I said, sometimes God speaks it through another person. Sometimes it might just come as you're reading the scripture and there's just this, this phrase or this word that comes out and you just feel like God's just driving that right into your heart. You just need to pay attention and you need to trust God. You need to, to take, if it, if it reflects the character of God, you know what? I, I'm not sure you need to hear something. Just take it. Because if it's godly, he wants you to have it. He wants you to have it. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if you don't know if your name's written in the book of life, I again want to assure you he knows your name, but, but he wants to know it even more intimately, and he wants you to know him more intimately. And so he is here today inviting you 
to become a part of his family so that he can give you a new name, so that he can call you a child of God, so that he can call you forgiven, so that he can call you redeemed, so that he can call you a new creation. He wants to do that right now, and and you just have to open up your heart to him and welcome him in. I mean, he's right there. He wants you more than you can comprehend. We sang about that earlier. We've asked a few folks just to stand up here, and maybe in this process, you... You just need an embrace from your Heavenly Father. He's here, but he's got some people that, that he's kind of putting in in proxy for himself just to give you an embrace. So if you need that, maybe, maybe God wants to speak that new name through that embrace. I don't know. You're welcome to come up and take advantage of that. Before that we sing the song, I want to read... A scripture to you. We, we had brought up part of Isaiah 43 to you before, but I want to read the first seven verses. Beautiful passage of scripture. But now, God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, that was his given name, and I lost my place. Jacob, the one whom you started, Israel, That was the new name that God gave Jacob. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called you. I've called your name, your mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're going through rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am your God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt, all of Cush and Seba thrown in. And, and for us today, we know the cross was the price he paid for you and I. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade creation just for you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'll round up all your scattered children, pull them from the east and the west. I'll send orders north and south, send them back. Return my sons from distant lands, my daughters from faraway places. I want them back. Every last one who bears my name. Every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory, yes, personally formed and made each one. I'm going to speak a benediction over you, and and then we're going to listen to this song, and if, if you're able to just sit and listen through this song and ask God to speak to you, please do. If you have to go, we understand. But But if you can just sit or come forward and... and be embraced. Please do that. But, but I want to speak this benediction over you, and it's, it's taken, it's probably the most common benediction that, that comes from the Scripture. And I've read this benediction, I've spoken this benediction many times, but I never noticed the line that comes after the benediction. The line that comes at the end, this is in Numbers chapter 6, And it's the 27th verse. So he speaks the benediction, and then the writer says this, So shall they put my name upon my people. It's through the speaking of this benediction that they're saying, I put my name on my people. So as I speak this benediction to you, I trust the Holy Spirit to speak to you and put his name on your heart today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.